Not bad. Yes. Man, I show those logistics for just a couple of minutes. Yep. I'm really excited for this presentation, which has been a couple of years actually in the planning to be able to have Mr. Masucci here. For those who I don't know, my name is David Hoffman. I teach at the Public Policy School and here at the Law School. I run the Duke Cyber Policy Program and I've been collaborating with the Center for Innovation Law and Policy here at the Law School on a series of events where we're looking at the semiconductor supply chain and the law and policy issues associated with that. In that regard, we could not have a better person here to talk about these issues than my good friend Ricardo Musici. Ricardo and I were colleagues at Intel for seven, seven years, uh, working on a variety of cybersecurity and privacy issues and a little over a year ago, uh, Ricardo was tapped to take the lead for all of Europe, Middle East, and Africa of looking at incentives from governments to start up new semiconductor manufacturing uh, and assembly and software operations to be able to deal with a lot of the global semiconductor supply chain issues. Uh, and so without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Ricardo. Thanks a lot, David, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very thrilled to be here, and thanks for showing up here uh, today. I, uh, as David said, I work with uh, Intel in my, my daily work. I am the director of security and technology policy, and uh, in this period, I spend probably 90% of my time, uh, or 80% of my time, on uh, EU chip sector development. Uh, you've already heard this is the uh, legislation in Europe uh, that is going to create a frame for semiconductors, uh, similarly to what the US chip sector uh, is doing in, uh, in the US. So, what I would like to do today, if uh, we manage with the technology, um, <laughs> I would like to give you a broader context of the, the current uh, global semiconductor ecosystem. We'd like to highlight some of the trends uh, that could also be helpful to explain why uh, the European Union and the US decided to come up with their own uh, legislations on uh, uh, semiconductors. And so, this, in the second part of, uh, of this conversation, I would like to uh, to draw your attention on uh, some of the key objectives and provisions of the YouTube chat. So let's get started with the, the first, uh, first section. And it is probably important to set the scene and try to understand a bit uh, uh, how it is the uh, uh, supply chain for, for semiconductors. So uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but uh, we can simplify the uh, description of, uh, of the semiconductor supply chain by saying that there are three essential steps. One is chip design, one is uh, wafer fabrication, and then um, assembly and test. Uh, wafer fabrication is where um, those big uh, uh, silicon pitras right, are uh, you know, cut into, into dyes uh, after having uh, created the um, uh, interconnections, the integrated surface, uh, circuits, uh, sorry, uh, on, uh, uh, on the wafer. And then once these wafers are cut into small dies, this is the time when uh, uh, the single die is going to be packaged. Packaged means protected, uh, but also packaged uh, uh, is um, packaging is the phase where those dies um, are put on a substrate and the interconnections uh, are, are made and so this is what then make, uh, make chips, uh, chips function. This is the traditional flow. Uh, in, the, in the last few years, in, um, advanced packaging has become uh, a more and more prominent technique, uh, technique because um, it actually, in, in this phase where the dyes are packaged, um, by increasing um, the density and the speed uh, of the die-to-die -die interconnections, we can, we can get more power, more energy efficiency, more performance of those, uh, of those chips. And this is very helpful, uh, not just because you can potentially combine chips from 
different manufacturers, but it's also uh, very important because right now it's becoming more and more difficult to miniaturize uh, transistors, and so this is a way to increase performances while uh, you know keeping um, uh, keeping the uh, the size of uh, keeping the density of uh, of transistors uh, to the latest uh, to the latest generation. So uh, to complete. To complete the, the description, I think it's important also to mention that the value chain of semiconductors is much broader. Uh, and so you can find uh, uh, throughout uh, the supply chain some suppliers. Uh, su uh, they supply uh, design tools, they supply uh, fab equipment, they can supply also materials. And then downstream, uh, you can find uh, the uh, original equipment manufacturers. They are those that build the system. So system to there. Um, and then those are uh, the companies that then sell either to other businesses or to uh, consumers. I think it's important uh, also in, in, in this primer and this uh, quick overview of uh, the semiconductor supply chain also mentioned the two most important uh, business models uh, in industry. One is integrated device manufacturers. Uh, these are uh, chip, chip makers that are designing, producing, and uh, assembling and, and open test also their, their products. This is the case, uh, for instance, of, of Intel, of uh, Texas Instruments. Then the, the, other, the other business model is where chip makers decided to go fabless. So um, Broadcom, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, AMD, they design their own chips, and then they send those, those designs to foundries like Global Foundries or TSMC, and the foundries manufacture the chips, and then the, um, the assembly and test phase is, uh, is also performed by other, other players that are uh, identified as OSAPs. Any question here? Because this is kind of important. Do you know where the Samsung is located in those phones? Thanks for the question. Samsung is uh, a great example of uh, an IBM. Samsung, uh, but Samsung also offers some foundry services to third parties. So I would say that the majority of their semiconductors are under the IBM uh, model, but they uh, they also provide some foundry services. Thank you. Do, do some of the Apple's manufacturers take issue with subsidies for companies like Intel that might compete with them? Uh, yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we can discuss about this also later in the, in the presentation, but uh, it is true that right now policymakers have a big focus on production, manufacturing, because uh, US and, and the EU uh, are really dependent on Asia and the manufacturing that happens in East Asia. So right now there's more emphasis on uh, production. However, um, funds in under the U-Chips Act and under the US Chips Act are also directed to uh, fabulous companies when it comes to uh, design R&D, for instance. You mentioned that one of the benefits of the advanced packaging is that you can combine chips from different manufacturers. Can you talk a little bit more about like when is that used, why is that valuable, and why is that such a differentiator? Uh, great, great question, and, and it's one we can, we can also uh, you know, we can this, uh, offline after, after the after the lesson, uh, there are there are there are multiple uh, applications for this, um, mainly for uh, client, uh, uh, namely laptops uh, or clouds, this, this type of uh, this type of applications. And uh, the, you know the, the advantage is that you you can you can pick the best you know for for each uh, functionality uh, that you need for uh, for the final. <coughs> Uh, for the final system that, that you need. This might be a little tangential, but are there national security concerns with foundries? Like, is there some kind of like consumer verification, like 
a foreign malicious entity is creating chips for a missile the the, missile the, system. The, the, there are some sort of tr trusted uh, foundries programs, um, mm -hmm. but I'm. Um, and and this is this is clearly a critical critical issue from a national national security national security perspective. So yes, um, yeah, there are both in the US and Europe. These are concerns for policymakers and regulators. Uh, I want to be mindful of your time, and uh, and so I would like to. Um, describe three, in my view, very, very important market and business dynamics long term. The first one is the ever-growing demand and consumption of semiconductors. The third one is the manufacturing decline that I already described in Europe and in the US uh, for, for semiconductors, and the consequent dependency on, on Asia. And the third one is the fact that higher costs uh, have driven over the years increasing specialization and consolidation of the semiconductor market. Uh, Kearney, uh, the strategic management firm Kearney, uh, described uh, the demand and consumption of, uh, of chips in Europe um, for, uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, here you can find also the, uh, the reference in case you are, you are interested in uh, reading the report. This graph shows clearly how uh, the demand, uh, the consumption of chips uh, in, uh, in Europe, driven by technologies like uh, uh, AI, autonom autonomous driving, 5G, cloud, IoT, will be will skyrocket over the next 10 years, and uh, they estimate a compounded annual growth rate of 15 percent. Uh, while for mature technologies, so those uh, those chips that uh, let's say, uh, more established technologies uh, that have been on the market for, for a longer time and that are used for, uh, for a number of applications, the uh, annual rate growth, uh, uh, growth rate sorry, uh, will, be, will be around 3%. This shows how, uh, in the foreseeable future, we can expect increasing, increasing demand driven mainly by, uh, by, new, by new technology. The second aspect uh, that I wanted to, uh, to underline and highlight is the manufacturing decline in the US and, and in Europe. If you look at these two graphs, uh, and especially try to focus on the two lines at the, at the bottom of, of, of the chart on, on the right, uh, you will see that um, Europe and the US today account for roughly uh, 9 and 12 percent in their global capacity, in their capacity of, uh, in their semi semiconductor manufacturing capacity, while just 30 years ago, the U.S. accounted for 37 percent and Europe for 44 percent. This shows how in, uh, uh, in 30 years, because of uh, uh, choices linked to business models, a lot of companies went public, or also because uh, some uh, OEMs, uh, think of Siemens, Ericsson, they exited the, uh, the phones market in Europe, and so there was not the same, uh, the same demand for, uh, the same demand for leading at chips in, uh, uh, in the continent. So, you see that the decline corresponds to an increase, especially in China, of the production over over the last 30 years. Uh, this trend is even more apparent, and the decline is even more dramatic. If you, sorry, I'm, I'm the slide. <laughs> <laughs> it's even more dramatic if you look at uh, at the chart on the right, uh, that is focusing mainly on uh, um, leading edge technology. So for the for the purpose of this study, they consider leading edge uh, uh, old chips below 10 nanometers. And you can see that, uh, especially the portion linked to uh, Europe, is uh, going to, to become irrelevant uh, in, the, in the next few years if no uh, major investments are done. This little bump in the line here is the um, manufacturing site that Intel has, uh, has completed uh, this year in, in Ireland and will be considered leading edge until 2025, 2026. 
another important element uh, to, to consider is uh, how the, if, if, you, if you look at this the decline uh, uh, in some regions and <coughs> an increase in production in other regions, it is very apparent if you look at the top three semiconductor companies in the world, and actually you can see that their facilities are mainly in, uh, in East Asia. Um, Intel recently announced uh, uh, the construction of a, of a fab in Germany, and uh, this is going to be beneficial probably for the entire global supply chain because by having um, more uh, more locations, uh, we avoid also the, the risk of having single bottlenecks, right, and, and single point of failures in the global supply chain. Uh, as I was saying, the, the, the third aspect that I want, the third long-term aspect that I wanted to, to stress, and that is going to uh, that has influenced also the decisions of, of policymakers, is the fact that um, over the past 20 years, uh, if you see the, the chart on on the left, the number of semiconductor companies uh, that could afford investments, the technology to uh, produce a, a leading edge, so the most advanced chips, the most innovative uh, technologies, uh, went down from uh, um, probably a, a more than more than 12 there, 15 to 3 in uh, uh, in the in the last few years. And so this shows the consolidation. And also, I wanted to uh, emphasize uh, in this slide on chart on the right that there is an increasing layer uh, specialization. Uh, we, we mentioned the fact that some companies decided to go fabless, and right now uh, the, the, the biggest players are uh, in the US, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, Broadcom, AMD. But you have also to think of other, other new players like Amazon and Apple that are, going, that are designing their own chips. Um, and then you, you can see that for the foundry and the assembly and testing uh, steps, uh, there's a concentration in, in East Asia with companies like TSMC uh, in Taiwan, UMC in, uh, in Japan, Glo um, uh, Samsung in Korea, and SMIC in uh, China. Looking at assembly <coughs> uh, you can see that uh, ASE and PowerTech are in Taiwan, uh, JCET is uh, uh, in China. But probably we can we can keep the question for later. Otherwise, we we, we won't manage to, to go through all, all the slides. <laughs> Besides the long uh, the long term uh, dynamics, uh, I wanted to highlight also some short term unpredictable events, and we experienced this very clearly over the over the past few years. Uh, if I say geopolitics, I think everyone thinks of the tensions between China and Taiwan. Uh, but also probably you are, you are thinking of uh, the, the war in Ukraine. They created several uh, um, several problems to supply chains and not just to the semiconductor supply chain. Um, another important element, in my view, is the role of natural disasters. Uh, think of last year, uh, 2021, a severe blizzard hit Texas. And so um, the facilities of um, NXP uh, and the cities of Samsung, they had to shut down because, because of this blizzard. And if you consider that with climate change, probably this, uh, the severity and uh, you know, the, these, these events will become more and more severe and, and more and more frequent, this is definitely an element to take uh, into account from a policy, uh, policy perspective. Uh, Last uh, but not least, pandemics. Uh, I don't think I need to, to say more, but uh, COVID uh, really put a lot of pressure on all supply chains worldwide. In the light of, of these comments, I think it's, uh, it's important for policymakers uh, and regulators to start having a shift uh, you know, in uh, a mindset when we think of global supply chains. Supply chains uh, have been global and structured to be more <coughs> efficient um, and so to deliver products just in time over the past 30 years because of globalization. Now that 
there's a bit of a crisis of globalization. Some, some analysts uh, talk about globalization, right? Uh, it probably, and, and we saw that there are so many unpredictable events that could impact uh, a supply chain. It's probably time to, to look at supply, supply chains that are more resilient and that are, and that are ready to uh, somehow bounce back in case of um, uh, in case of uh, unpredictable events. This was uh, the general context and, and the global the global ecosystem. I would like to take a closer look uh, at the, the YouTube chat. The YouTube chat was uh, proposed uh, uh, last February, uh, 8 February 2022. Uh, it is structured around three main pillars. Pillar one is about fostering technology leadership and investing in R&D and innovation. Uh, pillar two is about increasing resilience for for Europe, and so uh, this can be done by attracting attracting new investments of production facilities. And to do so, uh, there are some uh, interesting provisions in the YouTube chat that uh, help to uh, somehow lose the existing state aid rules uh, in order to be able to uh, build those manufacturing facilities. And Pillar 3 is actually going to create a mechanism for uh, better and closer coordination among member states. Uh, and it should also create um, an emergency toolbox comprising a number of emergency measures that could, be, uh, that could be used by the European Commission and member states in case of future chip shortages. From a, um, from a governance perspective, the European Semiconductor Board will uh, be composed of uh, representatives from all member states uh, and, and the group will be coordinated by the European Commission. They will be in charge uh, of somehow, somehow giving consistency and, and deciding also, um, let's say, the policy directions and, 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 the, and the key key decisions related to uh, the semiconductor uh, legislative framework in Europe. And then uh, it's probably also worth uh, highlighting how other there will be two other important players, the chip, uh, Chips Joint Undertaking, which is a public-private uh, initiative led by, led by the Commission, where um, industry is also, is also involved, mainly European chip makers. Uh, this is an interesting aspect where uh, you can see this also in other legislative initiatives or regulatory initiatives in Europe where there's, a, there's an attempt to work more closely with, uh, with local uh, industry, right? And, with, uh, and so in this case, uh, European chip makers have a more, more prominent role in the chips joint undertaking. <coughs> what industry is waiting and is uh, uh, looking forward to is the, finally the launch of the new <coughs> Semiconductor Industry Alliance because it should be the, the, the forum where industry can provide some input, especially on these uh, measures uh, of the emergency toolbox. Let's double click on figure one. Uh, as I said, boosting EU tech leadership is the overall goal of this pillar. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a willingness to strengthen design, manufacturing, uh, packaging, uh, R&D activities through, for instance, the creation of a virtual design platform or through the establishment of pilot plans uh, across different member states, uh, leveraging research centers, in order also to speed up uh, somehow the time between uh, you know, uh, research and development of good ideas uh, to execute those ideas and, and bring them to uh, large-scale production. Uh, there's an emphasis on, on innovation and quantum computing is identified as one of those areas of innovation that would be important for, for Europe. Uh, there's the acknowledgement of, uh, of the skills shortage and the need for attracting new talents in Europe. So this, uh, this would be uh, extremely uh, valuable for, uh, for confidence centers. And so the idea is to uh, work with uh, uh, R&D centers and build a network of competence centers across Europe. 
and finally more um, more support for SME and startups, uh, uh, financial support. Now, uh, the, the pain point uh, or probably the problematic aspect of, of Pillar 1 is the fact that the European Commission has only, uh, out of those 43 billion euros that were announced uh, as, uh, as budget for, uh, for the UCHIP Act, uh, actually the European Commission has only allocated 5 billion out of this 43. So the lion's share of uh, of the overall EU chips act will come either will come from private investors and uh, member states that will somehow uh, help with, with some public funding uh, in the, the, the investment of, of private uh, private companies. So in the policy debate right now, it's really problematic at this point because Parliament and Council are trying to find uh, additional resources that would actually help. Um, financing more, more projects for, uh, for R&D. Pillar 2 is about rebalancing the global, uh, the, the global supply chain by attracting more investments uh, in Europe, more semiconductor manufacturing investments, and so this is done in a very interesting way. Probably the, the biggest novelty of the UCHIP SAC is the, the concept of first-of-a-kind facilities. So these are facilities that are going to produce something that is not yet present in Europe. And it is so advanced uh, that it is in the strategic interest of the European Union to host these facilities. And therefore, um, th these conditions help somehow overcoming the strict uh, state aid rules uh, that we have in Europe. General rule is that no state can pro provide uh, uh, public funding to uh, a single individual company because this would create a distortion of the of the competition in the, in the internal market. Um, in, uh, other two interesting aspects of uh, Pillar 2 are the fact that companies that receive public funding are required to commit to invest in the next generation chips. Again, a lot of emphasis on uh, uh, innovation. And the second aspect is that uh, there should be uh, clear, positive impacts across member states. Well, this is called spillover effect and, uh, and spans from uh, job creation, economic growth, uh, uh, tax revenues, uh, but also cross-border knowledge dissemination. So these are very important aspects because in the end uh, the concern is that <coughs> there would be a concentration of investments in few in few member states. But since these investments will likely receive public funding, so you know, in a way European money or member states money, but you know, under a European umbrella, it is important that those investments are not benefit, benefiting just the hosting country, but also other, other member states. And so this is right now the, um, the point where uh, the European Parliament and the European Council and the Council of the European Union, sorry, are somehow discussing because small states are afraid of, of the fact that all the benefits will go to the bigger states with the bigger pockets, right? As Italy, uh, Germany, uh, and so this is from a political perspective. This is fascinating to see the, how the debate is, is evolving. Uh, and probably yes. Uh, Definition of first of a kind, uh, uh, there is an attempt by some member states and some political groups to expand ex as much as possible the definition of first of a kind so that also investments that are not so innovative can still get some, some state aid. So it's a, it's a clear uh, political game and, and you can only imagine why this happens. Third pillar. Um, Third pillar is about creating this mechanism of coordination across member states and finding tools and measures that would help to minimizing impacts of future uh, supply chain shortages and, and future crises. There, there are provisions on information sharing uh, across member states. Uh, companies should provide information regarding their, their capacity, their, their, uh, their the volumes of their production, and, and a lot of information that in some cases agrees to be quite, uh, quite business confidential. Um, then the Commission came up with uh, some emergency measures like 
priority orders and common purchasing that would be triggered in, in case of a crisis. Uh, and same uh, uh, for, uh, for export, export controls. Uh, the policy debate right now is, uh, this is definitely the pillar out of the three, the most controversial. So it's the most, uh, the most debated in, uh, in Brussels. Because potentially all these measures that I listed have a bigger, uh, bigger impact on, on the market and would be quite, uh, um, let's say, quite disruptive for, uh, for fund operations, right? Because uh, a company would be, would be obliged to, uh, to answer to a priority order and would need to deprioritize some orders and prioritize others because those orders are important for some critical sectors in the EU. So right now the political discussion is about how do we define a crisis, how do we def uh, what are the sectors that are really critical, and how industry can, can actually respond uh, in, a, in a reasonable way you know, to, to, the, to this type of request. Last but not least, uh, if you look at these emergency measures uh, that are measures that also other countries around the world, including the United States, are, are thinking of or have already thought of, it, it is of utmost importance to uh, have more international coordination in order to have, you know, in order not to create uh, uh, problems for uh, for companies that are that are operating in multiple jurisdictions. I hinted to the EU-US collaboration. Probably semiconductors. Uh, are the area where the policy area where uh, we can uh, we can really see a close col a close collaboration, close coordination with uh, with real results. Uh, policymakers are, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic came up with their chips act. Uh, they are they are similar in terms of objectives. They are slightly different in terms of execution. Uh, and I and I mentioned already that the U U.S. chips act is backed by substantial budget, uh, 52 billion, uh, billion uh, dollars were secured with the US chips, and, U.S. Chips and Science Act last August. So you have uh, 13, 13 uh, billion dollars um, allocated for research and development and roughly 39 billion dollars allocated for manufacturing. Uh, and uh, large majority of this money is dedicated to leading edge uh, production, so leading edge chips production. Uh, the European Union has been more explicit about the need for uh, fast track procedures, especially environmental permitting procedures, uh, when it comes to these investments. And because, as you as you probably know, to build a, a fab takes let's say three, three years to, to build the fab, another additional year to equip the fab with the right, with the right equipment, and then to, to make sure that, uh, that the fab is running at full capacity takes you know, a little bit more than, than four years. So in between the, the political decision and the, aqua, and the actual execution, it takes a lot of time. If you add that on top of the you know, um, natural um, times the, the, the natural timeline uh, of a fab, also a couple of years for environmental permitting, this, this would really not be, uh, not be conducive of those policy, policy objectives that policymakers have in mind. And the EU, US uh, um, Trade and Technology Council, uh, you know, is a, is a new um, is a new platform, let's say, for uh, for the two transatlantic partners to address uh, critical issues. There are ten uh, working groups. Uh, we are heading towards the third ministerial meeting that will take place in uh, the U.S. Uh, roughly uh, around December. I don't know yet the, the location, but uh, semiconductors is one of the topics that will be discussed uh, right now. Uh, EU and US are trying to find uh, a way to have a common early warning system for semiconductors so that if there are some signals that things are going badly for, uh, for semiconductor supply chain, there, there, there can be an exchange of information between the two partners. Uh, one of the uh, 
uh, one of the goals also of the U U.S. Uh, tech, uh, uh, tech and Trade Council is um, a better communication, and this communication and coordination includes also government incentives. So, for instance, when uh, the Biden uh, administration uh, adopted some um, some incentives, uh, some some tax breaks for uh, ele uh, electric vehicles uh, assembled in in the U.S. Uh, this created some some friction, for instance, last month with with the EU because this is a clear example of its incentives that would uh, benefit uh, uh, U.S. automakers, but uh, somehow somehow harm uh, European or non-U.S. Uh, uh, automakers. We are talking about incentives, government incentives, and uh, and, and this, uh, in, in the mind of some some analysts, uh, it seems that we are uh, witnessing a global subsidy race where all major countries with uh, with the biggest uh, semiconductor ecosystem are putting uh, substantial financial resources on the table to make sure that. Uh, their semiconductor sector is uh, is growing and, and, and can uh, can continue can continue prosper. So uh, it is uh, it is quite uh, I would say striking the fact that the EU and the US are uh, sometimes uh, uh, debating and discussing quite lively uh, about. Uh, the, uh, the subsidy raised between the two sides of the Atlantic, but if you look at the money uh, that that is that is being dedicated to semiconductors, uh, is somehow dwarfed by the money that has been uh, allocated by by some uh, East Asian East Asian governments, and so it's really um, it's really interesting to see how this will develop going forward. What is clear is that uh, the level of technology complexity and um, the, uh, the increasing costs that are needed to build a power uh, will make government incentives more and more and more important going, uh, going, going forward. Uh, um, uh, two more slides. Um, this slide uh, is just to show you how the Boston Consulting Group and Kearney showed how, respectively, in the US and the, in the EU, the total cost of ownership and so uh, the, the, the uh, expenses related to um, setting up, establishing a, a, new, a new facility uh, can be 40, even 50 percent higher uh, in the US uh, or in Europe compared to some uh, competitive locations in uh, East Asia. So it's particularly, so the, the cost is a disadvantage actually since the, the capital expense is fairly similar um, in, in different jurisdictions because you need uh, the, the, the very same uh, sophisticated complex machines that are produced, you know, the extreme ultraviolet lithography machines that are produced by ASML in the Netherlands. All the major players need to use those machines. Those machines don't, don't have a, a different a different price if you if you're located in in one region or another no and and actually uh, fabric equipment is the biggest uh, um, the biggest amount uh, let's say of, of that capital expense uh, the big, biggest price tag is uh, manufacturing equipment followed by the construction of, of the shell the construction of, of the fab but then all the operational expenses uh, are different in uh, uh, in the different jurisdictions and are dramatically driven down in East Asia by uh, some government incentives in the form of uh, direct subsidies or tax credits. I would like to conclude with, uh, 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 with I have two more slides. Well, and, uh, this is just to close a little bit what are the next steps in, uh, in Europe and I am uh, I wanted to draw your attention on, on a couple of uh, upcoming upcoming initiatives. So the EU Chips Act uh, is extremely important for the semiconductor sector, and um, the, the concern now is that if it is not 
adopted swiftly uh, the objective that the European Union has to reach 20% of global production of leading edge um, chips by 2030 will not be will never be will never be achieved. We we knew already when it was announced that it that it is an ambitious goal, but still to um, to somehow see some remarkable differences in uh, uh, you know the, 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 the cur between the current situation, which is roughly. 10% to 20%. We need we need to we need more more investments in Europe. <coughs> uh, speaking of uh, supply chain uh, shortages, uh, the European Commission published last month uh, a single market emergency instrument that somehow borrows some of the ideas of the UCHIPS Act when it comes to um, emergency measures, and so there will be. Uh, vigilance measures and also emergency measures across all economic sectors. So this legislation is still in the making. Actually, that the lawmaking process just started. So if you're interested, we can we can discuss in a few months what are uh, what are the outcomes. And um, it is interesting to see how the European Commission is not thinking only at strengthening the semiconductor supply chain uh, with the EU chips up, but is also thinking at the upstream. Uh, Part and let's say or or, or what happens uh, upstream um, of the semiconductor supply chain, and so they are looking at critical raw materials, which is actually uh, a very very uh, another very important uh, uh, to, to factor in. So to conclude. I would like to leave you with these takeaways before we uh, before we open up for questions. We have 15 minutes, not bad. Um, as I said, government incentives will play a critical role to change global supply chains from just in times to uh, just in case. Uh, the EU chips act is going to improve state aid rules for semiconductors, but as I said, the the, uh, the adoption hinges on budgetary aspects and some emergency measures that are you know the focus of uh, of the current political debate and so we would need a swift adoption of, of the act for to give more uh, legal certainty to prospective investors uh, international coordination is going to position uh, europe for for greater for greater success <coughs> and also as i said in the last slide europe is also working on other initiative to strengthen the, the global uh, the, their their supply chains across uh, across all economic sectors. This was my hopefully not too long uh, and hopefully interesting overview. Uh, I thank you for, for your attention. I look forward to the <laughs>
but also um, in, uh, in a number of uh, uh, related projects uh, to produce uh, renewable energy or you know to buy green certificates to make sure that somehow there's a, they, they counterbalance their negative impact on, on the environment with some positive actions. Do you, do you think um, as the supply chains get more regionalized and less globalized, we could kind of see like a rise in prices overall in semiconductors and also kind of, kind of a slowdown in like global innovation and you know, potentially like seeing an end to Moore's law? Oh, well, there are three, three questions here. <laughs> <laughs> and all very, all very difficult. So um, it is true that we, are, that we are seeing a trend towards a regionalization of, uh, uh, of supply chains. But I don't believe that we can expect uh, the semiconductor supply chain to become just regional. Uh, so uh, industry across the board, uh, European chip makers, US chip makers, even Asian Asian players, everybody wants to to keep the the, the supply chain global. Um, also because uh, you you can still leverage some some cost efficiency. Uh, the the lesson the the lesson learned is that we cannot have imbalances that are so so big and severe like like today. So we need to rebalance uh, the, the global supply chain. Um, I cannot predict if this will translate to higher prices, um, uh, but uh, but that is why also uh, there's there's a need for a broader discussion also with with governments on on the strategies to. Uh, to follow to make sure that then the cost doesn't uh, doesn't end up uh, harming the, the, the end users of, uh, of, of semiconductors. Uh, and regarding Moore's law, uh, as an Intel employee, I cannot, you know, <laughs> be confident about you know the, the pace of uh, pace of innovation and, uh, and the ability of, uh, of engineers to. You know, to always get to to the next generation. The, the example I, I brought uh, of uh, of advanced packaging, for instance, is a very promising technology because still uh, allows to to make breakthrough. Okay, uh, but but um, but it expands the idea of innovation not just to you know to the miniaturization of transistors, but to a number of other. Uh, of other techniques that are going to improve performance, process of, uh, of chips. And so I'm confident that Moose Law is still, still alive. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, sorry. Oh, yeah. uh, I was wondering to your uh, earlier point of cost effectiveness in terms of operational cost. To set up a fab, what portion of the investment goes to operations, uh, to current adjusted value, of course? And uh, how does that inform? Uh, uh, in your position, uh, your alliance with Africa, or your investments in Africa, I know that you oversee your uh, strategy there as well. Uh, I'm just wondering if there is a chance that that operational cost can be offset uh, to okay. reduce the dependency on Asia and move somewhere in Africa. To, okay, I see. Um, well, thanks for, thanks for your question. I, I don't have you know, the, the, the exact figures. I... Um, I mentioned that. Uh, let me try to do some some maths. Probably 60% of the capex is uh, fab equipment. Okay, 40% of the capex is uh, the actual construction of, of the fab. Now, uh, if we, I think it's um, I think you have to add another, but it, it really depends on the uh, the location where you have your fab uh, to, to to quantify. But you if if a fab, let's say that a fab is 20 billion and 13 billion are uh, equip, uh, equipment and 7 billion are construction, you should add uh, uh, probably another, another 10 in terms of operation for 10 years. But it really depends on, on a lot of things. So don't quote me on this. If you need more, if you need more, more, more details, I can, I can check. A and it really depends on, on you know, on the technology that is produced in that in that fab. So this was just a just an example, but might not apply across the board in, in the old industry. Yes, sorry, yeah, uh, I cannot understand who was first, but okay. 
I don't. <laughs> so we, we spoke already. We <laughs> talked already. <laughs> yeah, uh, my question is a little bit more broad. Uh, I was intrigued uh, by like the first the first part of the summary, and then it tied to your pillar three, which is like making the uh, supply chain change from just in time to just in case. But uh, you also said that this one is the most controversial because it makes it has a lot of trade offs in that you may have like the supply chain wanting to do a certain decision, but in order to have a better supply chain that's able to be prepared for anything, you may have to go with other decisions. Like, what are some sort of like best practices in order to make sure that we are still transitioning to a supply chain that is uh, able to survive a lot of different events, but is also being able to not make too many trade offs, but then losing maybe profits or other areas? Um, this is this is the, you know the somehow the the conundrum that that policymakers of any industry are, are facing at the moment uh, because um, it is unrealistic uh, to to just replicate everywhere all the different phases um, of the semiconductor uh, supply chain uh, because it would not be uh, not just realistic from a practical standpoint, but also from an economic point of view, would not make sense. At the same time, we need to uh, move away from the current situation, which is bad, <coughs> there are few bottlenecks, and if something happens. So um, one, um, one interesting, in, in my view, uh, one interesting uh, avenue could be uh, working with like-minded countries, and you and US, you know, is my, my you know, where my mind goes first, to try to find also um, more complementarity in the investments. Yeah. Uh, if we can ideally create a sort of transatlantic uh, semiconductor ecosystem, we would be able to <coughs> uh, somehow to allocate the right, the right resources uh, for the right projects uh, without having fear of you know uh, missing on on other parts of uh, of the supply chain. So probably, if go <coughs> sorry, if governments are uh, are brave enough and and, and wise enough, uh, this is the the direction yeah. we, we should take. Go there and here. Yes. You, you, you. Sorry. Um, so, uh, uh, my question is, so uh, the recent uh, technology export bans are regarding China from the U.S. side, uh, how would that impact uh, the growth potential, demand fueled growth potential in the EU as it relates to uh, the semiconductors manufacturing? Oh, that's, that, that, that's an interesting question, uh, and, and really pretty complex. Um, certainly, you know, all the export control measures, uh, especially uh, especially in the case of partners, should be somehow coordinated. Uh, and this, this is probably the key for the EU and the US to make sure that even if there are export controls that apply to, to other jurisdictions, there are no major, uh, major downsides to you know, to the other partner, and that that is where I was. That is why I was calling for you know a closer closer coordination of, of these measures, uh, because it could well be that you know uh, an initiative taken by one government could, could harm one of one of the partners. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about India because I noticed that India there's. Um, I couldn't see it on the graphics, and I also remember reading somewhere that they, you know a lot of people in India and companies are saying that they're going to skyrocket with semiconductor production. I think it's like 62 billion by 2026. Yeah. People will say so. Why are they lacking this infrastructure now? Are those you know are these numbers of prediction accurate? Let, uh, let me uh, let me link this this question also to your question because I missed completely the the African the, the African part of of the question, right? Um, so I, I had the, uh, the, the chance to, to work closely with our site selection team in Europe, uh, assessing different different sites uh, for, for our future investments. And it's mind-blowing the number of requirements that these teams have 
to find the right site. It's a very complex uh, combination of factors that span from uh, the economic, political factors that that we all have in mind as you know uh, people with a public policy legal background. We, we think immediately of those things: uh, the presence of, of an ecosystem, uh, the geographical proximity to uh, to customers. These are all very important elements. But then there are a number of uh, technical uh, requirements. Uh, besides, you know, the size of the plot, but there are really things linked to the quality of the air, the quality of the soil, uh, the nature of the soil, um, you know, the, the presence of vibrations. Uh, if there's a railroad uh, not far from, from, from the site, the risk is that this will damage the, the machines, okay? Um, and you mentioned a very important word, which is infrastructure. Uh, a fab runs 24/7, 365 days a year. So you cannot uh, you cannot afford the minimal power outage. Okay, you cannot afford anything like that. So you need to, to, to make sure that the, the infrastructure around around the fab is ready, and uh, and the, and the country has also you know the the right um, uh, the right infrastructure in place to support this type, this type of inve investment. So, uh, all this to say that there are some countries that are probably on the verge of becoming major players in uh, uh, in the semiconductor uh, ecosystem, but still need to make you know step up in, in, in some of these areas. Um, India, I think, has uh, allocated roughly 10 billion uh, US dollars for for new for new projects. Uh, so it is. Uh, it is clear that, that probably you know some semiconductor facilities will be built there. Maybe not for leading edge technologies, but or or for some back end operations, part, parts of um, parts of the uh, overall supply chain. Um, but in general, what um, what is it interesting in India and and also in other in other jurisdictions, including probably some African countries, those that are more developed, is that. The foundational layer is talent, engineers. Before building the next generation of hubs, you need to have, uh, you know, uh, in house, let's say, you need to have the next generation of, of engineers. And so, uh, having uh, having that talent, having that, that uh, skilled workforce, is the starting point for for any country to build their own semiconductor ecosystem. Yes. You have one more? Yes, if you have time, I, I have time. Okay, <laughs> one more. So th this may not be a question that you can answer, um, but in, in times of short-term crisis, like when a disaster does hit, and companies like Intel are forced to make very difficult decisions about where to prioritize supply chain, I guess, what do priorities look like for semiconductor providers, and is that something that the EU is considering writing into their crisis response? Well, um, when uh, you know the, the planning uh, of, of production is a very complex operation, very very complex practice, uh, and there are clearly, uh, in, especially in the larger company, there are a lot of people working on this, trying to trying to understand, uh, trying to to make a realistic forecasts of uh, what is happening, trying to adjust uh, uh, the production lines accordingly. Uh, now, these are all business decisions, and it would be dangerous if these are uh, somehow mandated by, by legislation. Um, we, have, we have to consider also that in the, in the current chip, chip uh, shortage, for instance, it is depicted as a semiconductor chip shortage, but in the end, uh, most of the fabs around the world have worked at full capacity. There was no crisis for the sector. It was that some economic sectors, like the automotive, during COVID, decided to hold off and say, OK, we, uh, we are not posing with these orders. And in the meantime, other sectors that were critical during, during the pandemics for you know, all our um, remote uh, uh, connections, uh, you know, uh, learning, uh, working from, from, from home, etc. So cloud, uh, for instance, uh, uh, servers uh, that, that, are, that are supporting cloud, 
uh, smartphones, <coughs> laptops, and all this, the, dem the demand uh, grew so highly that those lots that were previously occupied by the automotive um, sector were occupied by uh, now by by these new uh, <coughs> by these new sources of, of demand. So in the end, it was a crisis leading to bad business decisions taken by the automotive sector. So uh, for this reason, back to your question, I don't think that. Uh, that in, um, in the legislation you should have anything prescriptive regarding how uh, every company plans uh, its production. Right. Ricardo, thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Sophie Sushi has agreed to take on an appointment as a visiting technology policy scholar oh, here at Duke as he talks about the importance of transatlantic cooperation and the strategy. That's what we're also going to be trying to do at Duke with Ricardo's help. So thank you all for coming and thanks again, Ricardo. Thanks, everybody.